good morning very early good morning <laughs> to you it's 6am yeah. you what time is it it is yeah 6am here in in london very nice oh. to be with you great so welcome welcome to um business world's um event and launch of india's most sustainable companies uh we've already spoken about this but it's been uh, you know it's it's today's it's the culmination this event is a culmination of several months four months of a lot of research we started speaking with business world 6 months ago four months of research on coming on on uh, assessing 200 companies and thank you so much for being here um you know you have you are the chief executive uh, officer at polymateria in the uk and for those who uh, you know who don't know them yet they develop the company develops biodegradable and compostable plastics uh, and earlier you were the chief sustainability officer of bt group and uh, even before that you were a pioneer in setting up sustainability at sachi and sachi and accenture one of the early team members of those of the sustainability teams there and it it was it's no surprise to anyone that uh, B- business green james murray of business green has called you one of uk's most high profile and influential uh, sustainability executives um, um the guardian sustainable business blog um you know they've named you as one of the top sustainability executives and sources of sustainable news and uh, even before joining uh, polymateria uh, in january uh, you know the the um, and you know you you wanted to be the you wanted the company to be the tesla of plastics um and uh, the and you know the wef besides that the wef has which which big made a lot of big news and the wef has also named you as uh, a young global leader which is where we met um you know for the first time and you know you have guided me now you've been a friend and a guide for now 8 years so you know time really flies um so it's a great pleasure for me to be uh, in conversation with you and uh, speak about issues which are close to both your heart and my heart uh which uh, which is linked to the work that we are doing and also a, b- a few questions about you because you to me clearly is somebody who's leading with purpose and which is what we need leaders of large and small organizations to do more so tell me uh to start with you know how difficult is it let's start from the deep end <laughs> so how difficult is it to get 7 billion people to move to biodegradable plastics um well um I think uh it's a great question and um it's the reason I really wanted to come on and talk with you all this morning because um if you if I've always thought in any of those roles that you you mentioned before uh in any of those roles that I've done I've always felt that the best place to test big ideas is in India so the world's largest democracy uh one in 10 people on planet earth are are uh, in a village in india um so if you really want to figure out if your idea is strong enough to scale if you can take it there and tap in to the innate entrepreneurial spirit of of the indian people which is like no other place on earth but also i think the real understanding of how to do things bottom up The rest of the world tends to be very process led, very hierarchical. Um and I know there are some of those things in India, but there is also a real understanding of of social movements and how to kind of give power back to the people. So, um you know, I've always liked to think that if you can test an idea and scale it there and if you're reaching into the villages of India and the various different regions, you know starting with 1.3 billion people on planet earth it's not a bad way to get to the uh, to the other 7 billion <laughs> okay um but you've clearly chosen a, a challenging task to bring even if you're testing it in india and i clearly see where you're coming from that india in a way that you can get things done in a way at the same time it's a nice uh, pilot to to kind of expand it to the rest of the world but you've clearly chosen a very difficult task so why biodegradable plastics what made you move towards that because you were in telecoms at bt and you know we uh, how did you move to this Well, I think like many people um in 2017 David Attenborough's Blue Planet um uh TV show really touched me. I've I've worked in environmental 
uh, the environmental movement for for my whole professional career, and it, it, it really um, touches me deeply to see our impact on the the natural environment. And some people choose to work in government. Some people choose to work in um, NGOs and, and and face it off in the in the front line. And you know, I'm still really connected to to friends who do those things and and people who approach it in that way. But my belief is, is really in the power of, of innovation and, and businesses' ability to come up with solutions to our biggest environmental issues. So I saw a lot of parallels, but what we were doing with British Telecom, with a lot of the clean technologies we were developing and how successful the growth of that portfolio was. By the time I left, I think that portfolio was worth about 3.2 billion uh, British British pounds from a from a standing start. So clean growth really is possible, but it's a different type of growth. You 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 really need to uh, run it differently as a as a PL. So when I saw David Attenborough's um, Blue Planet in October 2017 and I really started to get aware of, of this particular environmental issue. Um, it seemed to be in so many ways um, uh, uh, a kind of a canary in the mine and it symbolizes all of our other environmental issues. It can be very difficult to talk to people about climate change and something that is, I know this isn't the case in rural India, people are really dealing with it on a, on a day to day basis. But, um, you know, for, for other parts of the world, um, plastic pollution is something we all see every day. It's, it's not it's not a developed world issue or a developing world issue. It's not confined to any one place. You see it in the shires here in, in Buckinghamshire in England. You know, I see it when I go to 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 Delhi. You see it everywhere. Kids get it. Business people get it. But there were no solutions and I, I didn't see any, you know, um, Unilever, I didn't see a Tesla, I didn't see a Patagonia, I didn't see a really credible, scalable technology that was out there that was was capable of, of solving that problem. So I think it was around that moment that, you know, sometimes in life when you, when you start to you know, see things, synchronicity happens and the founders of Polymateria approached me I was seven years at BT and I said to, you know, my boss, Gavin Patterson, that, you know, this opportunity had come up and, you know, he wished me, he wished me the best. So um, I've been there two and a half years now and um, our, our, we, you know, we're doing our best, as you said, to create the, the Tesla of plastic. Great. So you mentioned that it is, um, plastics is uh, indeed not a developed country problem or a developing country problem. Um, you know, it matters to countries across all economies. Um, but however, in developing economies, plastics hold um, a special place because of its affordability and its tenacity. So with biodegradable plastics, if you, if, and you know, I know your uh, polymateria is working um, closely with the Indian government, Indian corporates, uh, but given how price sensitive the market is, how price sensitive the segment in Indian population which uses plastics is, uh, do you think that biodegradable plastics would stand a chance to be used by the masses in India and also in other developing countries? Yeah, um, well look, that's, that's why, you know, I, I believe that if you want to see if, if, if something a big world changing solution solution can scale you've got it you've got to test it in, in India first our price differential tends to be 10 to 15 percent on the cost of the plastic packaging itself now if you compare that with paper and if you compare that with um, you know other materials um, uh, which can be as expensive as, as 300%, maybe 600% the cost, um, it's, it's, it's very, very affordable. So the question is really up to big corporates as they're weighing up different choices to have something as affordable as ours and as, and as credible as ours. But just to come back to what you said, the problem with plastic is, is not necessarily its in-use um, phase, you know, it, it performs marvelous things for us. And with the COVID virus now, you know, we're seeing more and more how we are reliant on it for 
uh, PPE, you know, the, the mask that we all wear, that's, you know, polypropylene, non-woven material. Um, and as you've said, in the developing world, it's, it's incredibly important, important for food safety and, um, you know, just, just the natural utility of everyday life. But its problem is end of life because of its because of its resilience. So really, it was that that our technology focused in on to create something new and different <clears throat> that didn't just fragment plastic and claim biodegradation, which was happening previously, but actually go right into the hard <clears throat> crystal structure of the plastic material itself and biotransform it, which is what we do, into a grease or a wax-like material. <clears throat> but then make that grease or wax attractive to nature. And we're the only company in the world that can take polyethylene, which is, you know, very, very commonly used by, you know, people in markets and, you know, <clears throat> all, all around India and the rest of the world, fully back to nature in 226 days. But what's really exciting is we can time control it. So we can predict the exact month when the technology becomes active, and program that in at point of manufacture, working with the specifiers, working with the brands. Now, that allows for all of plastic's usefulness and its utility, it even allows for reuse, but it also can allow for end of life and recycling, if recycling is an option. But then once that time is up, just like anything else, it's perishable and it will fully return to nature without any problems. So we've really focused in on that end of life problem for plastics in developing the technology. Thanks, Nihal. So, you know, this video video is going to be pushed on to various business world platforms and it's going to be um, sent out to businesses and corporates. Uh, there will be corporate leaders who would be watching this. Um, and uh, what message would you like to give corporates? Because you clearly you, you said that you would like more corporates to be uh, using biodegradable plastics instead of normal plastics. What kind of message, what message would you like to give uh, corporate uh, leaders, decision makers, at this time, when uh, their focus is, uh, you know, is on growth and on survival, right? On on human survival, people, um, uh, you know, on keeping people on their salaries, um, on uh, on on a resurgence of their uh, production um, and uh, and growth. What message would you give them to also not forget about? waste management and pollution and uh, perhaps embrace biodegradable plastics? Well, um, you know, in October last year, Prime Minister Modi announced, you know, the single use plastic directive and ban and that's kind of come into to, to full force. And shortly after that, we met with Indian government and we shared our technology. We shared the, the new standards that we were developing with the British uh, Standard Institution, which is now launched. The Indian government are one of the first governments in the world to be testing against the new British standard. Um, their environmental testing facilities uh, with CPET in, in Bubareshka uh, are, are uh, equipped, fully equipped to, to test against this, this new standard. And we have been going out to corporate leaders, not to, to everybody, but with those who have firstly a large uh, plastic production footprint, but also a uh, strong track record in sustainability. And we've been inviting them into that program, uh, which is run by Indian government to get their plastic packaging prototypes developed using our technology, tested. And as long as it passes the new um, British standard, it will be allowed to commercialize on the market over there. So it's a, a selective but uh, very exciting program that once that first wave uh, uh, finishes, India will be the first country in the world to have demonstrated this technology end to end, made in India, tested in India, supported um, by Indian entrepreneurs and, and big businesses, but also with the uh, support of, of the Prime Minister's single use plastic directive, which will allow for this as part of its uh, biodegradability commitment. So for some businesses, this will be a choice between staying in business um and and you know maintaining the you know the the existing infrastructure and investments that they have um and for others it will be an opportunity to renew their commitment to sustainability 
um, and tap into that consumer mindset that you know I heard from some of the other presenters. Um, it's not just millennials, but increasingly people want to see and they will reward businesses who are first movers on technologies like this. Thanks, Neil. So this policy, there's corporates and you seem to be working with both uh, stakeholders, but you also mentioned mindset change in consumers. And uh, that's uh, a stakeholder group where in countries like in a country like India, which has 22% of uh, its population below the poverty line, um, it gets very challenging for them to be thinking about waste management because you know empty stomachs can't be thinking about the planet. So um, you know waste management and plus and and a consciousness towards uh, using plastics must go hand in hand with. Uh, mindset change within consumers but even you know uh, within the population and also maybe a, a, a social um, you know uh, work on the social side as well so is there what what are your thoughts on this are you purely working on waste management are you considering the social aspect of what you do and the change that needs to come in there Look, I think I think it's a great question and it's a it's a great challenge and it, it kind of brings me back to the first thing I said which is that um, if if you really want to test your idea and if you really want to solve these big world issues, um, you have to adopt this furthest first mindset. You, you have to think about not the next billion uh, people on planet Earth that are, you know, potentially going to be, um, you know, the, the, the middle class of the future, but actually the last billion people on planet Earth, those who are you know, the, the most impoverished, as you said, and particularly at times like this, who are focused on other things. And I think by going out and listening and, and meeting with the community leaders and the people in these villages who are, you know, connecting with them on a, on a day to day basis, um, it, it's incredible how much they care and how much they do actually have the ability to, to do the right thing. They'll do it differently than maybe you, you thought. So you have, to, you have to allow for that, like that, you know, that plastic container or that you know, um, bag that you may have put your technology into and created an innovative solution for them. That may be part of their livelihood, you know, and they, they may depend on that for a two or a three year period, but that's okay if you, if you if you know that, you can have a, a social innovation along with your environmental innovation, and you could create something that serves that need. But the key is going out and listening and, and thinking broader than price, thinking about people's values and how they're living uh, in, in villages you know, all, all around the, the, the provinces of India and taking that insight into how you're actually developing the technology. And if you work for the last billion people on planet earth well then you'll work for everybody else yeah i think one of the embedded uh, social benefits in what you're doing at polymateria is that you're not banning plastic so the informal economy and a lot of people who are involved in the economy of plastics they don't lose their jobs if the you know by, by using biodegradable plastic um uh, it's just that there is a reskilling which is needed both in um, and reskilling of talent as well as reskilling um, in terms of infrastructure and technology that is needed um, to move away from traditional plastics to biodegradable plastics such that jobs and the you know in people's lives are not affected what are your thoughts on uh, how how i'm sure you, maybe you have a plan uh, about how would you make that happen the reskilling in people as well as uh, technology and infrastructure to move away from producing traditional plastics to biodegradable plastics. Yeah, well, look, I, I think um, it, it's important to differentiate between biodegradable plastics that maybe didn't work, that just physically fractured yeah. plastic and haven't you know, done much to create confidence within either the policy arena or within industry themselves and also maybe biodegradable plastics that need certain end of life conditions and infrastructure in, in order to work. The reason we created our technology and we created the new British standard was to actually deal with all of those things and have a real bedrock of scientific proof. But at the end of the day, what we're, what we're creating is, is plastic that is now perishable. 
Um, but what we've learned by listening to consumers and working with some of the specifiers and the brands <clears throat> that we're engaged with is that because of what went before us, biodegradability is a very confused space. So the way we have been approaching engaging people and reskilling them in this new type of material <clears throat> is to communicate the perishability of the materials themselves and to really focus in on that and to allow for the right time frame to give people every chance to get the materials back and get them into the circular economy. So I have a couple of cups sitting here beside me that are actually developed um, by a famous global brand, but they're in testing in, 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 in CPET in Bucharest at the moment. And I can't, I can't show it because it's under NDA, but on that cup, there's something called a recycle by date. So the recycle by date is key to actually getting out there into communities and reskilling people. So people, if they see plastic fugitive escaping the circular economy and in the natural environment, we set that recycle by date to allow for pickers and allow for other people to get it back and get it you know, back into the MRF, the mechanical recycling facility, if that's an option and have it turned back into, into something else. So we've really focused in on communicating responsible disposal. Ideally, that's recycling. But ultimately now with our technology, plastic is perishable and it, it has a, a very familiar thing to, to most people from a food perspective, a use by date or a recycle by date in our case. But we've been testing that with the brands, with people who are uh, as you said, dependent on it for their livelihoods to see what's the best way to to educate them and reskill them. But ultimately, they need to become your champions. They need to be the ones that you tap into and create this bottom up energy and excitement for the technology, because, as you said, it's their livelihood, but also they're the front line of the movement and they have a chance to do the right thing and be part of this whole environmental agenda. And if you do that right, you know, they can be your biggest advocates and your biggest allies, which is, you know, the, the whole furthest first mindset. And, you know, if you're doing that well, you know, you've got a solution to this big global problem. Wow. Great. Neil, you're always taking up these very difficult problems and you find a way out. So I'm very hopeful for this one as well. And I remember our many conversations when you were at BT um, and, uh, you know, um, and, you uh, so I, I, I was wondering if you could share with us some of the big challenges you faced at BT because you would have these problems just starting out as Chief Sustainability Officer in India and you were, you know, giving me all the tips you could. But then what were the biggest challenges that you faced at BT um, and uh, how did you overcome those? Um, not very successfully. Um, I, I, I always struggled with, you know, um, convincing big corporates to take risk um, because of what we said at the very start that you know the nature of big corporates are it, it, it's it's about process as opposed to people and the reason I love India is is the people that you meet and their complete irreverence uh, for process um, and that allows you to get things done a lot quicker and test things even if you fail you know be brave go out and try something um, it falls over, so what? Get up and do it again, learn from it, make sure it doesn't happen the next time. That is a concept completely alien to most FTSE companies, most Fortune 500 companies. We create entire functions and arm's length divisions between functions in order to stop businesses taking risk. Now, the UN have called for a decade of delivery. Just to zoom out for a second, we got 10 years to get this right, to get wind energy, solar energy, technology like ours, electric vehicles out there, not for the next billion, but for the last billion. They are the people who are gonna be most uh, impacted by climate change. That's where the solutions are needed. So everybody needs to adopt this for this first mindset, but that means taking, taking a lot of risk and more risk than businesses are used to taking. And frankly, business as usual is only able to deliver incrementalism and every corporate leader sitting there listening to me at the moment will be nodding their head saying yep that that is the case but 
that doesn't mean that 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 you you have to be a hostage to to that that particular fortune. You can work with disruptive businesses together. It's not David versus Goliath, you know, Amazon killing Walmart or anything like that. It's about it's about working together um, as these new disruptive entrepreneurial businesses that are emerging come out um, and and taking risks together. And the the way that you will get over the kind of the the, the hierarchies and the and, and the silos of, of kind of business as usual is by trust and that's obviously very difficult at this moment in time because you and i as you've said know each other nearly 10 years we trust each other implicitly if you call tomorrow i'd be there you know and and you know i i know i kind of i kind of feel the same so you feel the same so trust in this in this kind of remote way of working is very hard to create but everything moves at the speed of trust so we you know we have to find a way of of getting over the incrementalism of business as usual and for me that's why i do what i do now it's to go into a business that is taking more risk but answer all of the questions the big corporates are going to ask because i've been on that side of the fence i know what due diligence looks like and i know what procurement are going to you know negotiate on and i know marketing are going to need answers to these questions and i know that you know, if you just do a top down coming into the chairman and the CEO, but you don't engage working level, you get this not invented here mentality, you get get shut out, you need to engage at all levels of the business. We know all of these things. So we bring that kind of experience into engaging the biggest businesses in the world and help them to get better at taking risk. You know, it's the movie listening to this, thinking, well, that's that's very, very cheeky of him to say, but equally it's it's true. And frankly, we don't have time. We don't have time to be too reverential and, and, and too respectful to process. We need to take more risk. We need to trust each other more. And we need to get out there and build those relationships that will allow this to happen. Relationships like you and I have. You know, Neil, um, uh, this, is, this is very precious what you say, because um, you, we need more people to be on that bridge, right? To be able to be speaking, knowing how to speak to different stakeholders differently, differently, and also to know how to collaborate and trust, to be able to, to, to trust, to allow yourself to trust and collaborate. Um, but also, uh, you're leading a team, you're working with people. How do you manage that relationship? Because I struggle with that as well. So you have to have others as well be, be like you. Mm. And we, as yet, I hope that the world will move to another era where there'll be others who would be on that bridge that you know we, we mentioned earlier in this conclave as well, um, and would know how to collaborate and trust. So how do you take people along with you towards doing that? You have to show that you are incredibly serious about integrity and whatever the values of your business are. The, the thing about any business, big or small, that puts its head above the parrot and, parapet and says, see that big environmental or social issue over there, we're gonna solve it and we're gonna innovate to solve it. So we're gonna do it through market forces, through capitalism, commercial means. Because you're doing it that way and it's not philanthropic goodwill, um, you're going to have every academic, every NGO, um, uh, every expert on social media and other places challenging you. And they're going to tear you apart if there are any weaknesses. So if you're greenwashing or if your science isn't as strong as you say it is or anything like that, you're going to get exposed in, in, this, in this day and age. So the only defense that you've got against it is to create a culture of integrity internally. And in BT, we used to talk a lot about speaking truth to power. And I used to hate that because it was like it was an exception, you know, something that would happen once a quarter, once in a blue moon, when the chairman would meet the new graduates and they'd tell him, you know, what they really thought, you know, and this was like a, a coachable, teachable moment. You have to have that be the case every day. And it's your job as a leader to make sure that's not the exception, it's the norm. So the first time your most junior scientist or lab technician stops some big name investor walking into the labs with a cup of coffee because, you know, drinks clearly aren't allowed in the laboratories, you celebrate her, you champion her, you promote her if you can, you talk about it every time, which I'm doing now, and you make sure that people know that in this business we don't take shortcuts, we take integrity very, very seriously. 
But you also need to manage the other side of this coin, and this is where it gets difficult. You have to run a consequences culture, and you have to be prepared to move people on if they aren't serious about your values, they aren't serious about the integrity. Um, and if you, if, you, if you do that well, other people will see um, that, that you know, it, it, doing the right thing matters in this business and we're not about you know taking shortcuts if if a third party lab report comes back and it's not passed in our case this new british standards that we don't go well it nearly made it it nearly made it so you know that's okay that's good enough it's it's not and that can't be me that that has to come at every level of our business and possibly the thing i'm proudest about in polymateria is that that is alive and well that everybody in our business knows that doing the right thing is something we take incredibly seriously yeah thank you um and you know i call it the 99 and one percent so 99 percent you have to be you know always motivating and and uh, you know um get the right practices best practices applauded but at the same time that one percent of the one time that one percent time you need to showcase the consequence and that's it if you just do that once just well you don't need to do that more. So, uh, but thank you, Neil. Um, you've also uh, set up, uh, you know, while you were at Accenture, you set up, uh, you were part of the team that set up the sustainability practice, which now our dear friend Peter Lacey <laughs> and, and others, you know, they're 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 leading it. Um, and there, um, what advice would you give uh, companies in India? And clearly, there are so many. There are actually the majority of companies would need to set up their sustainability practice. So these would be business as usual companies um, which are doing well, which have the intent, uh, but then they would need to set up, set up their sustainability practice institutionally within the company. What, what advice would you give them? Yeah, well, look, there's a spectrum of um, ways that businesses commit to sustainability. And when I first started going to India and working with, you know, our own, um, um, you know, people there, um, w what was happening at the time, and this is this is going back a couple of years ago, businesses in India were just starting to give 2% of uh, pre-tax profits to foundations and to CSR type activities. And, you know, that's a good start, but it's, it's peripheral to business as usual. And when you see what the real leaders are doing, like Unilever and Nike and others, they're aligning it to the product engine and the innovation function and also to the brand um, and getting all of those things right where your chief sustainability officer, if that's what you call it, um, has that ability to bring a lot of these you know, environmental and social choices, frankly, into product design and they're able to intelligently make those trade-offs and then make sure that that translates into advocacy and and how the world around them perceives the business these are incredibly difficult difficult things to get right but if you have a um, a csr function sitting off to the side that doesn't have the mandate to drive the product innovation engine and the pnl forward um, you're only ever going to have a kind of a bulletproof jacket around the business, something to kind of point to if Greenpeace or somebody else shows up and says, you know, your track record in the environment is deplorable. You say, well, look, we've got this, we've got this nice report. And, you know, last year we reduced carbon by 2% in our call centers or something like that. That's not what this is about. This is about bringing it into the beating innovative heart of the business and and spotting the opportunities to get ahead of the curve on these big nexus issues because this is happening it's the future there's no there's we, we're either going to create businesses that solve these problems or create businesses that create them and the ones that create them we won't talk about them in 50 years time they, they won't exist we, we will be celebrating the teslas the patagonias the polymaterias that's what will will be at the top of the the FTSE and, and other other indexes in in a couple of decades time, but that means you need to get it into the innovation function and you need to align it with the brand. But critically, when I say alignment with the brand, people think, well, this is somehow about uh, you know getting more credit than you deserve. It's actually about listening, and all great marketing and branding actually starts with building networks with the most important stakeholders in the world around you. So if you 
if you care about a particular social or environmental issue, go out and meet the community leaders, meet the NGOs, listen to them, listen to what they're saying about your product or your service, and bring that into how you're innovating. Co-create the problems together with them. You don't have to do much more than that. If they see that, that you, you are taking their concerns seriously and innovating and solving their problems, <clears throat> they'll be your most powerful advocates. And, and they will champion you and create a ripple effect around your brand. <clears throat> and that, that's the key to advocacy is listening. And, and the brand has the ability to do that. But just to be clear, it's, it's not about um, communicate first, act later. It's about listening, acting, then other people do your communicating for you. Thank you. Ah, for a minute, I thought you were frozen. Um, so, um, uh, you know, you, Neil, you're clearly championing a, a very important uh, technology. Um, and as you said, you know, R and D is very important at your company, and it, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the research which goes into creating the kind of biodegradable plastics at polymateria is different from uh, a lot of maybe the other biodegradable plastics that are available. What are the other technologies that you are excited about um, that are at the moment nascent in stage, uh, which uh, you think uh, could be um, could be you know, could, could be brought to life or could be uh, scaled up for a more um, sustainable future? Well, let me, let me stick to, <clears throat> to what I know, which is, you know, this, this, this particular agenda. So, you know, transforming plastics and this, this whole stream, um, the, the two big trends are simplification and purification. So um, technologies that simplify the packaging materials. So, you know, as, as you said, um, pack, plastic provides a lot of great utility. It keeps food, food fresh in a way that paper and other things, you know, frankly can't do at a low cost and, um, and everything else. But innovations that actually provide those barrier properties, the barrier layer that protects the food and allow it to, you know, have a, have a useful life longer than it would, it would otherwise. That whole concept of, of perishability is, is important, but um, it, it, it also means that we need packaging that is simpler and a lot of those complex packaging systems will in the next two years get designed out and there will be new mono layer type systems that take that complexity into one um, uh, type of, of material and provide all of that function and properties together. Why? Because the circular economy needs it. We can't have complexity within the circular economy. For the whole thing to spin and work, it needs to get much simpler. So there's, there's technologies out there that are providing solutions for packaging and, and simplifying them. And then the other thing is purification. So another big trend to watch as, as, as investors or as potential corporate sponsors is anything that is purifying the toxic nature of the materials themselves. So uh, people don't know this, but uh, you, you know, polyolefins, which are the most fugitive, therefore most you know, littered plastic on, on earth are a very pure material, which is why we have focused there first. It's where the problem is biggest, but it's actually easy to get them back to nature if you have a technology like ours without harming the natural environment in any way. That's not the case with polystyrene. It's not the case with PVC. It's not the case with anything that has a lot of toxic materials inside it. So another big trend is anything that's purifying the stream and creating purer packaging materials that work just as well when it has to return to the biological cycle, because everything has to go back to nature sooner or later anyway, as they do in the technical cycle. So, you know, in both of those areas, without, you know, naming names, there's lots of technologies that are helping to purify and simplify the, the, the packaging materials themselves. And I think another very, you know, exciting area is home composting. So um, one of the limitations with compostable plastics has been the reliance on industrial composting to provide the end of life infrastructure for those particular materials to biodegrade. Um, and the conditions those uh, composters need to be run at in order for the materials to have any chance. But the democratization of composting, coming back to this whole concept of, of, of furthest first, this is co-ops and, and villagers and people that have, you know, that they're, they're you know, working in, in, you know, the agricultural sector, but having an ability to compost locally on site and combine green waste 
together with packaging and you know return that to organic material and use that uh, as nutrients on you know next year's crop that's a really exciting um, development and there are some technologies there like PHA and PHB that at the moment are are you know very expensive but I think with new innovations coming through and that's an area that we're working on that would pass the home composting standard we can provide real scale there as well but we can get composting as a solution out to everyday people um, which you know frankly we have managed to do to date. I think you're on mute Nina. You know, you mentioned about technology being uh, being expensive and um, the part of the study that we did with in partnership with uh, Business World was also to look at the R&D expenditure uh, per sector in India and uh, the numbers um, you know are a little dismal um, so for example um, FMCG uh, the sector it spends 0.39% uh, on an average the FMCG companies they spend 0.39% of their revenue on R&D um, the, the agricultural industry sector is okay it's 4.75 but then the others are you know like oil and gas is 0.36 infrastructure is a 0.12 so uh, clearly I think um, you know that's uh, there has to be a policy as well as a market driven um uh, push towards more R&D and uh, better technology. Um, I also have a few questions um, from the audience. So there's uh, Harish who's asking that there is always a myth about biodegradability. Uh, we don't know if this breaks down to CO2 and HTO or else to microplastics. I think this is something that you kind of referred to as well. Maybe you want to do yeah. a deep that which is even worse than the landfill polluting. Uh, so uh, how do we feel? So maybe you want to address that. And uh, also, how do we feel about home and industrial composting based on our need? Yeah, so Harish, you're, you're dead right. So there were technologies previously, well, called a range of things, but oxo-degradable, oxo-biodegradable, photodegradable technologies. And what they all had a single reliance on was oxygenation. So this is the process of oxygen attaching itself to a branch in the polymer chain, but creating a fracture and a weakness. So, you know, you and I could then break the plastic, but all we're doing, as you rightly said, is taking plastic and, and making microplastic. The cornerstone of our IP is knowing how to actually go into the hard crystalline structure and use a combination of the natural agents of decay to attack and destroy the crystallinity. If you don't destroy the crystallinity of plastic, you're creating microplastic. So that's like the corner of our innovation. Now, what that looks like to, to, to you or I is a, a grease or a wax-like material being in cre created incredibly quickly but that's also not enough. You have to make the grease or the wax attractive to nature. So the second thing we do is we add a prebiotic aspect, which then makes that the microbes and the fungi and the bacteria consume it. And then what you should create and what you can only create is carbon dioxide, water and biomass. The same as you would have had done previously with the, with the composting standards. But because there's been so much false promises and, and false claims in this space, we created a standard to show the difference between <clears throat> somebody who's you know, uh, making one claim but just creating microplastic or somebody who's creating a wax and somebody who's able to show in real world environmental conditions that that wax fully goes on and biodegrades. Nothing left, no microplastic, no nanoplastic, just carbon dioxide, water and biomass. And those pass fail criteria are now in the British standard <clears throat> and are being tested by the government of India with some of the biggest plastic manufacturers in the country. And some are passing and some are failing. So, you know, you're right. You know, it has been like the Wild West previously. And, you know, coming back to uh, Minya's point on, on innovation, none of these companies were investing in innovation. <clears throat> they were just, you know, doing very, very basic stuff like adding salt to plastic and claiming it was biodegrading. But the world has caught up with them, you know, and now it's time for better innovation. But the devil's in the detail. And that's why we need standards that will govern the rigor of the scientific claims and that needs to be supported by government and, and by industry. Um, but it's, it's a very good question. 
Great, thank you. There's also a question from Dr. Achintya Sen, who's asking that um, what message do you want to give to plastics packaging specifier and plastics converter to companies to mitigate the pollution created by plastics after end of life? Well, um, I mean, talk to talk to the governments, talk to CPET, talk to the CPCB, um, identify w one of your um, uh, packaging applications that have, um, you know, you think is a good candidate for, for biodegradability and, you know, work with your, your converters, your packaging converters, create a prototype and get it into the, the next wave of testing uh, at CPET in, in, in Bubareshka. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think having that um, movement of businesses and brands who have, you know, developed this new type of packaging and have it tested and passed against this new standard, proving not partial biodegradation and fragmentation, but full biodegradation and have governments backing and doing that, you know, we can really create a movement for change. Thank you. Nial, um, you know, I've known you for a while and you always take on very difficult challenges. <laughs> and we've spoken about some of these challenges. So I want to, you know, have a few questions about you as a person. Uh, because, of, you know, we've seen this even across the top 10 sustainable companies um, uh, in India, that it's leadership driven. At the end, it's the CEOs, at least in India, uh, you know, it's not yet embedded in the system, but it is the leaders, the CEOs, the owners, the promoters who are driving responsibility. Uh, within the company, uh, why and, and and you know Shalini Singh, who you heard as well, she's a CSO of Tata Power, and when I was speaking with her in preparation for her talk, and she, I asked her that why do you why you know why does Tata Power do that, and she said because it's purpose driven, um, and uh, you know so I want to ask you this question that why do you take up such difficult challenges uh, when there is an easier route to do that. Um, and uh, you know what? Uh, what message would you like to give the CEOs of these large companies? Um, you know, at, at this, at, in, in, in this context. Um, for for me, it's all about people, and um, I have to say that I, I kind of feel that as a species, we're kind of at this crossroads, and. In a couple of generations, I think, you know, we will, you know, we'll probably be a, a multi-planetary species. We probably will, you know, be, be resident on other places besides just planet Earth. But I think this juncture in our evolution that we're at now will determine how we go into other stars and other, and other solar systems. Are we a parasitic, resource-hungry species that constantly needs to extract more resource than we need or deserve and do more damage um, to, to other places? Or are we shepherds and stewards of the galaxy, galaxy that have a deep symbiotic understanding with our dependency and our connection to the environment? And, you know, frankly, it's in the dock. If you look at the way some elections are going in, 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 in different countries and how democracy is choosing different types of leaders, um, you know, it kind of comes down to um, us as people believing that we, we, we need and deserve better leaders who will champion this next era of human evolution and we'll kind of cut through a lot of the populism and fascism and, and other isms to, to kind of do the right thing. Um, and I get a lot of energy from, you know, getting out there and, and meeting people, you know, frankly, like you and our other friends and, and colleagues. And um, it's one of the hardest things about this lockdown scenario is I would have in the last 10 months probably have been to India three, maybe four times at this stage and, and in each and every one of those trips that had gone out and met people, you know, working in, in communities and, and working in the front line. And I take huge energy from that and I get great ideas, um, you know, but, but also I find, I find, you know, employees, advocates, people who are, you know, going to, um, you know, help this whole movement to happen. Um, you know, and, and that trust and the relationships that you build as part of that, frankly, sustains you because the environment is a very inspiring thing. And it's it's um, it's 
challenges are so massive that you can get overawed by the challenge of climate change. But if you bring it back to the thing that really motivates us, which is those individual relationships and family and community, and you can build networks that align with your values and you can translate those networks into frankly better choice of leaders than some countries have been making at the moment um, and you can hold those leaders to account and i think that's another thing that india is fantastic at is holding leaders to account um, and calling it out you know if, if if people aren't doing the right thing and we're not seeing that <clears throat> in enough other countries so um, i get a lot of energy out of my belief in humanity that i believe we will evolve to be a more intelligent steward-like shepherd-like species and you know spirituality is important in that faith is important in that but you know my faith is is in people it's in humanity and our ability to do the right thing um you know and, and you can't just surround yourself with people who are like you you know i don't think it's i don't think it's enough to kind of point at the other side climate deniers or you know, in, in, in our case, uh, you know, people who just live and run the business for the next quarter and don't care about anything else. And, and their idea of innovation is, is cost innovation and cost transformation. Um, you've got to engage that. And I think your success and our success as a species hinges on being able to find the middle ground and finding a way we can all move forward together. So. I'm obsessed about that. I get an awful lot of energy out of it. I, I, it does take a big toll on you. And the way I kind of cope with that is I get out in nature a lot. You know, I go out and I run and cycle and surf and mountain bike and do things that just give back to me and give me energy. Um, you know, but everybody has their purpose. And I think if you can find a platform where the the purpose of the organization aligns with your individual purpose, you can do incredible things. And I think it's on each of us to try and achieve that congruence and achieve that alignment. Thank you, Nia. We'll, we have another question uh, more on the on plastics. Um, yeah. and, um, Harish is asking that how would be biodegradable plastics work on laminates for, barrier, for barriers? It, it doesn't. Okay, it doesn't. It, it doesn't. So, so laminates and barriers at the moment. So, um, metallized BOPP um, is a is a problem. It's a problem both for recycling and for biodegradability. But we have programs, and I know there are other, um, uh, uh, you know, businesses, competitors working on solutions for the barrier layer, and also uh, laminate solutions that would. Um, be both biodegradable and also recyclable but again it comes back to that trend i was calling out harish about um simplification and there's a lot of work going on in the big fmcgs the big rate retailers the biggest packaging converters to create simpler packaging that can be both recyclable and also biodegradable and we're plugged into a lot of those innovation programs and working on uh, on solutions thanks well, one concluding question, we're uh, nearing the end of this uh, wonderful talk. Um, what is more important to you, Neil? Is it uh, bringing about change or is it more issue based? Because you've moved across different uh, industries and you're always so passionate. And there's something that I wondered that what makes you do this? Is it more, you know, making the world a better place or is it specific issues that are different points of time that you take on? Um, I think I think it, it's it's time based. So um, you know, the overarching thing is is somebody said to me once when I was you know an athlete and before I was a a runner, I was um, a rugby player, and and it was actually a coach who said to me, you know, whatever you do, make sure you leave the place. And he actually said the sport. He said leave the sport better off than than when you started it you know so when i used to run i used to take great pride in you know training hard and you know trying to find ways that you know you could achieve 
you know, performance improvement. But what really motivated me was inspiring others and and having that, you know, seeing that you were a source of inspiration for other kids that come from backgrounds like you, and they were maybe believing in their own abilities a, a little a little bit more. Um, but then I took that into Accenture, and when I was looking for a, a job and wanted to. Um, you know, basically make some money for a change as opposed to lose money as an athlete. Um, the whole concept of change really spoke to me. But as, you know, um, Mahatma Gandhi says, you know, all change starts from within and you've got to be willing to change yourself first before you can start to change the world around you. And I think if you do a good job changing yourself and you do a, a good job changing your immediate community, maybe that's your family, maybe that's uh, your business, um, you find that you get invited to change bigger and bigger things. Um, and you realize also that your skills become relevant to some of these to some of these big issues. So a lot of what we were doing on clean technology with BT is now relevant to plastic pollution. Um, but I, I feel that I've arrived there, you know, through a continuum of um, you know, wanting to really change myself first to, to learn about these things, to, you know, um, understand what works and what doesn't, what's the right thing, what's the wrong thing, um, and then apply those those lessons. And then that, you know, that that just kind of leads you through chance and destiny to, to, to the next thing. Um, I think as long as you're alive to those opportunities, something else always, always shows up. So I've never planned it. I've never sat down and said, you know, here's why I want to be in five or 10 years. I have no idea uh, where I'm going to be in five or 10 years, but I do think that this particular issue needs a Tesla. It needs a, you know, a Tesla of plastic and at Polymateria, you know, we're, we're, you know, doing a pretty good job of creating one. So, um, you know, if we can point to more Patagonias, more Unilevers, more, you know, uh, businesses like that, um, you know, I think people like me can retire happy. <laughs> well, one final, final question. Um, you, we have been talking about leading with purpose, but you, you, you spoke about something very important, which is people, they, them leading, them, li them living also with purpose. And in a country like India, Nial, um, it becomes a little difficult to do that because there's very little social security, which is provided by the state. Um, and so uh, you have to fend for yourself. If you lose your job, you know, there's no uh, bread coming into the family. Uh, what message would you like to give people? Uh, forget the CEOs, you know, the executives. What, would, what message would you like to give the young people in India that how can they uh, attempt to live and, and to follow their passion, follow their purpose, to identify their purpose and follow that purpose, given given the situation that the socio-economic situation we're living in? Um, I, I don't know if I, I'm not the right person to give kids in India any kind of advice, because every kid in India I've ever met has blown me away with their entrepreneurialism and their you know their optimism and their faith and energy in, in frankly a way that is so refreshing and particularly with this this current situation there's so much you know victimhood and and, and people who are you know um uh blaming others but you know the the the, the people that i've met and i've met so many people in in, in india over you know the, the 10 years 12 years now that i've been kind of going to the country they've taught me and i've actually spent a lot of time listening to them and you know at bt and now you know bringing people together from different walks of life in and and you know um tapping into that energy and that spirit and all I've ever tried to do is, is is give it a home, give it a platform. If there's a way, either a project or or a um, you know a theory of change or something could could take shape out of what I've learned from them, um, all, all I've ever tried to do is harness their energy. So I I don't think you know any anything I've got. To, if I say one thing, it's keep going. Believe in yourself. The change I've seen in India in ten years going there, from where it was to you know where it is now and you know i also see the disparity i see you know the, the the problems but you know it's a 
India is getting it right more than it's getting it wrong. And over the last 10 years, the progress has been, you know, astounding. And that's been people led. That's been the entrepreneur entrepreneurial spirit and the belief the Indian people have in themselves and their communities. And frankly, their ability to hold leaders to account. You know, it, it's it's the breadbasket of social innovation globally, as far as I'm concerned. And it's the world's biggest democracy. So you know, keep going, believe in yourself.